Okay, let's talk a little bit about effective graphing um, and, some, and some general approaches to, to doing this. Essentially, as we've talked about, you guys want to relate a thing to another thing, or perhaps one thing to another thing to another thing and another thing. Another way of saying that is, what's your hypothesis? I want to test my hypothesis. Again, does, does factor x influence uh, response y? So some of these I've shown you guys before, but let's have a, just take a quick little look here. So um, did we go over this? I, I get confused because we got screwed up last semester. Did we go over this stuff yet? OK. So um, stare at this for a second. I want you to tell me in a minute what this figure is about. West coast, east coast, and central. OK, so Ruben's saying there's something between west, central, and east. Is that a mass gas in the west coast compared to central or east coast? OK, so Elise says the, the number of mascots in these different regions. <laughs> Anything else? Volume of mascot costumes. Volume of, OK, so maybe it's not number of Mascots, maybe it's how big the mascots are or something. <laughs> okay. Um. Any other guesses? So we're, the key thing here is we're guessing, right? You guys, I don't know. Maybe it is one. Maybe it is one. <laughs> we don't want to have that in our data presentation, right? We want to be very crisp, very clear, stare at it. It might, it might be very data dense, and it might take us a while to fully understand and, and, uh, and, and play with the data, but we should be able to glance it and very quickly know what it's about. Very quickly know what's being measured, what's being presented, the units, that kind of stuff. This figure uh, fails in that regard. So here's a redone version of this, same data. So stare at this and tell me if you think this is better. Yay or nay? Yeah, and why is it better? Uh, let's go through some of the things that are improved from this version to this version. Okay, so there's, there's more, there's more. So here, the, the variables on the x-axis are labeled. Now, if this was date, 1960, 1970, 1980, I could probably just put the variables. I probably don't need to put year underneath it. That's, that's pretty obvious, right? But in this case, we don't know. Is West Coast the actual West Coast? Is it, a, is it a, a, a clustering of a group of teams, right? So in that case, having the conference division helps us. And in many cases, you, you want to label the axis as well as the variables. Okay, and on the, let's look at the y-axis next since we looked at the x-axis. This is totally the same thing. So we have the variable labeled. It goes from 0 to 36. But we don't know, again, what it is. So by throwing a axis label up there, mm, I see that's actually the, the, in cubic meters, that is the costume volume. <coughs> Generally speaking, the, des the description of the variable is in text, and then in parentheses are the units, percentage, proportion, kilometers, miles, whatever the, whatever the, the measurement unit was. Also, let's have a look. On that left axis, is that wrong? It's not technically wrong, but it's impossible to read. Mm -hmm. You get this a lot from your auto graphing routine programs, right, that we all use. They're all very helpful. But they don't know what, the computer is dumb, right? It doesn't know what's aesthetically appealing, what's easy to read necessarily. So the, a lot of times, you might get a default to something like this. It's like, now, this doesn't have 5 or 15 or 25 or 35, but so maybe you would choose to put an, a tick in between the ten, 0 and 10. Maybe not label, right? We could also choose to put grid lines behind there. So it would be easier. So the East Coast over there, is that, is that, what is that, 12? Is that 13? A grid line might make it a little bit easier for us to visually look across to see the, va the value. But, but overall, I would argue this is an improvement, right? Okay, what else? The legend. The legend? What about the legend? Instead of just telling you central, west, and east, it's the, telling you that it's an arable 
four plus one standard. Right. So this legend is worse than useless. Well, I don't know. Is that word possible? I don't know. This legend is useless. All this legend does is tell us what the bottom of the, of the x-axis says. What the hell? Why do we need that? Then they're like, oh my god, you got to make a different color because it's a different bar. What the hell is that? Every, now, you guys' first draft of your graph you're going to make and it's going to be tweaking. But once you've done your iteration, just like with our writing, and we edit, we edit, we edit, here the question is going to be, does that help? Does West Coast being white, does Central being whatever that is, slate gray, does that help? Maybe if we had a map, you know, either before this figure or after this figure, maybe that would help. But seen in isolation, this does not help. This, I would argue, is more helpful. This visually draws your eyes bar A to bar B to bar C. This is much easier to make comparisons. Adding the color here, if this is our only figure, does nothing. And that is what my old professor would have said it was a distraction, like a color thing for the <laughs> sake of color, as opposed to color or coloring to help with the interpretation. Uh, yeah. So I noticed um, on the posters that we looked at uh, outside, uh, yeah. the ones on the side, yeah, yeah. some of them didn't have like titles on the x-axis. And um, would that be because it's more like common sense and what, what they're displaying? Like the one with environmental terms that didn't have an x-axis saying, you know, these are environmental terms. Is that something worth like putting down? Yeah, so again, it's going to be, they're your figures. They're your guys' choices. And so you're going to go through some iterations. So you're gonna have to ask with your particular layout in your paper or in your, or in your um, poster, uh, do I really need that or not? If it's helpful, yeah, let's leave it in. If it's not, pull it out. And so the answer is a lot of you guys will have very idiosyncratic uh, decisions you have to make. And you're just gonna, my recommendation would be make the graph both ways and print them out and put them on the table and stare at them for a second. Do I really need that? Do I not need that? Show them to some people that haven't seen your graph before, your, your roommate or whoever. Hey, somebody, some random person in the library. Hey, can I borrow you for a quick second? Which of these do you think is clearer? Right? That kind of thing. And that'll help you make your, those decisions. But, but um, it, in general, over something like this, you probably want your axis labeled. In other cases, you don't necessarily need it. Uh, just a couple other things to round this out. So this has, now we have a, a figure legend for uh, in papers, our legend in a figure goes below it. In a table, the legend goes on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so now we say this is volume of mascot costumes of all minor league baseball teams and of 42, that's our sample size of all of them together, in the United States in 1999. And then over there on the upper right hand, uh, quadrant. It says the bars are mean values plus or minus one standard deviation. So now we have all the information we need. We know what this is. This is uh, a minor league baseball team things. It's in a specific year. There's a lot of data here. It's not an N of three. It's an N of 42. And the, and the uh, what was that? And the, um, and the, uh, I got thrown off by looking at my calendar. Uh, the, um, something else important, I can't remember. There you go, Merry Christmas. Okay, how about this one? This is in the, this is, this is a, a figure that appeared in the Wall Street Journal uh, several years ago now. And the text reads as follows, President Obama, in some bunch of words, the equi were equivalent to saying, ask the wealthiest Americans to pay, this was over a, a bill regarding uh, taxes, uh, to pay a little more. The mathematical reality is that Washington will need to soak the middle class because that's where the big money is. And here's that figure a little closer, right? So the folks writing this uh, editorial are saying, look, this is what's going to happen. They say they're going to tax the wealthy folks, but in reality, they're going to tax middle Americans or, or you know, people in the middle of the road. And they offer this figure as evidence. 
Is this figure evidence of that or no? Stare at it for a second. Yes or no? Is this is this tax is 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 this uh, tax directed at is most of the money in the middle income here? No. So Ruben says no. Why do you say no? Well, because well, I mean, yes. What is middle income? Because I think the most of it is still like in six figures. Ah, so a great example. And again, I didn't make any of this stuff out. These are all real things. So this was in a national newspaper arguing, supposedly, a, an, making an honest argument. This is an incredibly disingenuous argument. And it's counting on you being a lazy reader. So the, the hint, the key hint, is on the x-axis. Mm -hmm. So these are not even categories. The first category is people that make no money. Oh, yeah. The next bar is one to five thousand dollars is 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 what that's represented the next bar is five to ten got you got me mm -hmm. so we're following in in five thousand dollar increments the next one five thousand then the next one five and five and five and five and then all of a sudden huh sort of towards the middle it jumps up to ten and then it jumps up to twenty five thousand and it keeps stays around. then it jumps to a hundred thousand and then we're jumps up to you know five million and then more than ten million so the x-axis is not an even consistent binning of things. Mm -hmm. Are you guys with me? Mm -hmm. So if we were evenly to bin stuff, you'd look, it would look like this. I mean, we could, we could have done all the graphs, but I just did it quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So this is breaking incomes into fifths. This is where the taxable income is. Is this, and this is not commenting on the policy if we should or shouldn't. It's simply saying the reality is most of the taxable federal income is in the wealthiest one-fifth of the population. It's not the middle, right? So the other reason to have great data graphing skills is not only so that you can communicate, so that you're a more rigorous reader of other people's data, right? Just like, just like getting to be a better writer helps you read other people's stuff, being a better grapher helps you interpret other people's stuff. And, and, and be a better spotter of silliness or a better spotter of quality, okay? How about this? So this is, this is young, this statement is, young workers like Facebook, Apple, and Google is the title, was the title of this um, uh, article. And then there's a, a figure in here, excuse me, there's this table is in here that argues that you young people would really love to work for Facebook, Apple, and Google. Is this, is this helpful? Everybody's catatonic, no. Um, how about this, what if we graphed it? What if we graphed it? I would argue this is a little bit better, although it's still, there's still so many things here it's hard to read. So what if we did something like this, right? So it's all the same data that we're looking at, although this, is, this isn't quite as all of this is a, a truncated part of the data for this figure, but yeah? Mm -hmm. I have, there's no axes here at all. There's no x-axis, there's no y-axis. You, can you understand what that means? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily even need an axis depending on your graph. So not only do you want to pull in, pull out the legends, you want to mess with everything, right? What can we take away to be more clearly focused on the data? If we need axes, let's have those suckers in there. If we don't need them, is it really helpful? So we could, there's nothing technically quote unquote wrong with having stuff in a table, but this really helps us understand draws our attention to not just that Google is number one, but look at how much, how much larger it is compared to the next most preferred company, which is Apple, right? So this, this graphical presentation data is, is uh, more helpful if that's what we're trying to get at. And then here we just change the color of one of the um, bars and helped out. On top of that, the data are all still here. So we've actually labeled the end of each bar 
So, even, so you can use the, the benefits of the graph to sort of visually run up and down and see where they fit. But then if you watch you want to know the number, it's there too. So I would argue that this is superior to a table with only the company's name and the percentage. Because it's just like a table, but it's also in it, making it easier for our audience. Again, all of this is how can my reader glance at this and see what I'm talking about as, as easy as possible, right? There might be work I want them to do, but the first level, the, the, the immediate conclusion should be really obvious for them, really clear. Boom, oh, I see, Google is, is the tops. And again, that's what it looked like before. Okay, so what makes something uh, effective graphically? What do you guys think about, stare at this for a second. This is a very old uh, figure. This is a figure from 1786. So stare at this for a second. Way before PowerPoint. And tell me what you think we're, uh, we're looking at. Uh, if you guys, this is an old graph. If you guys can't read it, I'll just tell you right here. Uh, so this, where's my, where's my, where's my thing? My thing is hiding. I cannot find my cursor. Okay, anyway. So it's exports and imports. Top says exports and imports to and from Denmark and Norway. This is relative to um, uh, the UK. Uh, from 1700 to 1780. So on the bottom axis, from the left is 1700 to 80 years later. The, the text over the orange line reads line of imports. The text under the red line reads line of exports. So what are we, what are we trying to communicate here? Yeah, so something happened in uh, about 1755 or 1754 or so, yeah? Mm -hmm. So we went from um, sending more money out, buying more things, right? Mm -hmm. To shipping out more things. So this is, this is the first time this was ever presented this way. Before this, it was always presented in tables much harder to read. This, this uh, you guys just glance at this 300 years later or so, and you're like, oh man, it's bang, 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 bang. M huge improvement over the previous tabular uh, presentation of data. Great graphs are gonna be a few things. One, they're gonna be data dense. So they're going to allow readers to explore alternatives. Let's go back to that right there. So, okay, oh, the big nut is something happened around 17, right, 54 or so. Okay, so there's a huge switch. But we could also say, hey, was the actual uh, value of exports in 1720 the same as what, right? We could start asking those questions ourselves. What ifs? Well, is this this way? Is that that way? So data dense. We can explore alternatives. The conclusion should be obvious. Now that won't always work out, but, but great graphs, it's really clear what we're, the pattern we're, we're showing. And so that will help us uh, really clearly show cause and effect in an ideal situation, at least correlation, but hopefully, ideally, if we do X, we'll see Y. When you use some of your automated graphing programs, they'll come out with all this stuff. They'll come out with an axis on the top and an axis on the side and this and that, right? Maybe those are helpful. Maybe those just get in the way. That previous one I showed you from, with, with the uh, 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 employment uh, desirability, didn't have any axes, right? So uh, Edward Tufte, one of the sort of fathers of modern thinking about design and graphs, um, called that stuff chart junk. Other, other glommed on stuff that's stuck on there that doesn't, that people think they need, but doesn't really help with our interpretation. Uh, so a good graph 
the conclusion's obvious, and the focus is on the data, not some distracting whatever the heck. This next one is hard, elegant. What does that mean? I don't know, that's a hard one, right? That really is, in the, with the layout of your paper, with the layout of your map, with the layout of whatever, um, it, it's something that's aesthetically pleasing. That's hard because, you know, Carla might think it's one thing and, and you know, Ali might think it's something else. And so that's a bit of a hard one, but ideally it's, it's really aesthetic and it's easy to read. It's not that blurry stuff that we saw outside. It's not that, it's not that uh, hard, hard to, you know, so finely grained, we can't really distinguish one from the other, that kind of deal. Um, so this is Edward Tufte. I used to take you guys to one of his presentations back when we were small and I could afford to do that. It's expensive. But this is Edward Tufte. If you guys are curious, he's sort of, again, the, the, the godfather of this kind of stuff. Um, and he used to go around the country doing these presentations. Um, he's kind of full of himself, kind of a... Mm, um, and some people these days, some will say, oh no, he's got the wrong idea about certain things, but he really needs to be given credit for really directing a lot of folks to focus on the data and focus on elegant presentations. So, um, and that's him signing a book to one of our, one of our previous, cap look how big Capstone was back then. Well, actually there's, this isn't everybody, it's probably about half a Capstone, but back then that was Capstone, yeah. There you go. We've grown a lot. <laughs> okay, so other, other guidance from Tufty that I think apply now, even though some people have had some, taken some issue with some of his comments. Uh, this, I, these things I think are all um, really valuable. Show the data, right? So if we have data, let's show it, let's graph it, let's put it up there. Let's get viewers to think about what this means, right? So well-designed graph will help people to think about Again, you can, call, you can talk about cause versus effect or whatever, but really help people um, get beyond um, the, the simplistic thinking. We do not want to be like that Wall Street Journal figure and distort the data, right? So we might want to make it you know, clear what our point is, but we don't want to go to the point where we're, we're, we're doing screwy things with, with axes and artificially grouping things and stuff like that, right? Don't distort stuff. Um, we, we're honest folks, we're, we're being uh, intellectually rigorous. Uh, he talks about many data points. He created these little things called spark charts and various things, but, but uh, data density. So we wanna, I, as, as dense as we can make it, still readable. Good graphs make even complicated things easy to see, or at least the patterns within them easy to see. So complicated things are still readable. And they allow us to say, to do the A versus B comparisons. How does this versus that compare? How do the green spots for, compare to the orange spots or what have you? <clears throat> really well-designed stuff can start to uh, the onions can be, so still clear and everything, but if you stare at it, you can start to see different depth in there. And you can eventually start to see different levels of detail. Um, this second to the last bullet here, in our writing, your text, the posters are a little teeny bit different. Posters, we don't have a huge amount of real estate, so this is a little bit different, but for our written thesis or your written report for your job or whatever it is, the results, you should be able to read the text and get the main conclusions, the main results. Read the text without a figure and get the conclusion. You should be able to, uh, on the other hand, you should be able to look at the figures and get all the key conclusions from the figures without reading the text. So in other words, these things should reinforce one another. There's some, there's some exceptions, maps. Maps, you can't put all the map stuff in the, in the text, but the main nut, the main conclusions from the map should be in the text. They should reinforce each other, but they shouldn't be dependent necessarily on one another. And then another thing is that, that notion of elegance and, and aesthetics and stuff. 
So uh, there's all different kinds of formats for our figures. We're going to run through a couple different formats here, and then we'll see what you guys are thinking about in terms of your figures. Um, all kinds of different formats here. And I'll give you guys a couple handouts after today as suggestions. But these aren't perfect. <clears throat> and after you get a little bit of uh, experience graphing, I don't know if these are really particularly helpful. But at this stage, where you guys are just learning to walk, I think they can be helpful. So sometimes you guys will want to make a bar chart because you just saw a bunch of bar charts in the posters outside. Or you want to make a line graph because the last person that did your study did a line graph. You shouldn't do that. You should do it because it's the right thing to represent your data. And so I'll give you a couple, I'll, I'll, I'll share some of these with you, but basically there's, there's decision trees. Hey, is my data uh, numerical or categorical? And, da, 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 and at the end, I'll, you, you get a, hey, why don't you try this type of graph format to present your data? Um, just a, qu a quick note here about maps. You guys have all taken GIS. Introduc introduction, if not an intermediate. Um, and so maps are their own beast. Dr. Patch loves to talk to you guys about figures and math. So um, I'm not going to go too much into that until we see some of your maps. Um, but suffice it to say that all those principles you learned in, in GIS and in how to do your layout and legends and all that jazz, that, that they haven't ceased to be important just because you've you finished GIS. Um, but remember, we want to fully orient our, our viewer to that map. Is this So if, it, if we're showing a detail, we probably want to have a map of California or the US or something to right, contextualize where we are. Um, uh, there's different ways to um, help people see the patterns. One of the problems with, with maps and spatial stuff is you and I have evolved we evolved in the trees when we were hungry. So our senses are really keen, are really cued into looking for patterns. That appears to have been very helpful for finding ripening fruit. So we would, oh, this kind of tree at this time of year, that's where the, we're more likely to see food that you, fruit that you and I can eat that won't give us a stomach ache, that kind of thing. When we started moving into the, the hunting world, hey, this is where this type of critter tends to accumulate. So we have apparently, it seems to be, our, our psychology colleagues and, and, and cognitive behavioral colleagues, the current evidence seems to be suggesting that we were really good at finding patterns. And so we, we're always looking for patterns, 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 patterns. And that apparently really helped us way back when we were looking for those food sources and things of that nature. So programmed for patterns were we that we tend to see patterns sometimes now in this modern world with all these patterns all around us, we sometimes see patterns when there really isn't one. We sometimes think there's an, that these things are more tightly related than they are, than they are by random because we're, we're sort of predisposed to find the pattern that was very helpful in our evolutionary history, less so now, but we, but we have this this mental brain processing burden from there. So we can talk about uh, pattern in terms of detection, assembly, and estimation. Um, and these things, uh, pr you guys probably at least touched on, I might not have used these words, or probably touched on these in, in GIS. But we can talk about that when, we, when you get to the uh, maps if you don't remember what those guys are. But let's just look at a little um, example here. So here's a, here's a, here are some maps. Um, in this case, these are uh, chloroplasts, and these are, we're looking at stomach cancer mortality from this uh, couple decades. And so when you guys stare at this, what do you see? Okay, good. So middle to bottom, it's hard to see. Is it, is it slightly gray? Is it a little bit gray? Whatever. But what about... What about um, uh, high incidences. Do you see any patterns in that? Kind of. So there, there appears to be something going on with, with the area of the Canadian border, particularly around the Great Lakes, as Ruben is saying. Yay or nay? 
Yeah. New Mexico. And New Mexico, right? So that's so. Um, maps are good for for showing that spatial association with lots of data. Outside, we were looking at the um, armoring of the coast. Here are the main ones that are, are, are some of the main ones that you guys will be using. We have a few others, but the, this is we we'll just run through these really quickly. So you guys have a sense for when to maybe think about using this, when not to use this, et cetera. So this is a dot plot. So this would be um, uh, useful when we're trying, oops, sorry. This would be useful um, for showing things, particularly things like uh, opinion polls or number of students that responded to these types of questions, et cetera. Uh, leaves, on a, leaves on a branch, that kind of thing. Box and whisker plots. So these are going to show the range of things. These can go from max to min. Uh, these, these typically show the, the quartiles. So one for, where is it? I lost my, hmm, I don't know where my pointer went here. But anyway, so, um, so there's the uh, average or median in the middle of that bar. And then the area between the far whisker and the top of the bar is uh, a fourth of the data from the um, next top of the bar to the middle is the second, third, and fourth as we go across. So this is looking at the distribution of data. Histogram is looking at the frequency of various responses. Bar graph is just showing a, a value over um, uh, a particular variable, uh, usually time or, or length or some, something like that. Scatter plot, when we're trying to show relationship between two things that we that may or may not be related to one another. Line graph, so scatter plot is just data points. Line chart uh, shows a relationship. So by putting the line in there, you say one came, in this case, one came after the other. Either in temporal sequence or in sequence of the drug exposure or something of that nature. And then a stacked bar graph is usually used for something like distribution of uh, composition of a community or something like that. Okay, so um, to show variability of things, if that's what you're really interested in, uh, you want to think about something, some type of frequency plot. So example of those or potential things you could use there would be something like a dot, the whisker plot, or a histogram. These are really good. We have one category of data. So the length of the frog's leg or something of that nature. Um, and this really helps us say, hey, is, is it a normal distribution or is there a real tight, is it a bell curve or is it more like a spike, for example? And uh, this, this helps us talk about the distribution of the data overall. Bar graphs show, uh, pure bar graphs just show us a single variable. And uh, these are good when we have at least two categories. So the A versus B, that one that we had out there um, uh, that we talked about was lame. Mm -hmm. uh, scatter plot allow, allow us to compare, oops, sorry, allow us to compare uh, group A to group B. Independent, uh, when, when A and B is, are not necessarily collected uh, right next to each other in the same temporal sequence. Line graph shows the same thing, but when there's a relationship between the first, the second, to the third, to the fourth point, and that's what the line is meant to represent. Um, both of these variables need to be continuous, meaning they're not constrained between, uh, uh, they can be any, any value, that they're not uh, uh, constrained to be two or three values uh, in some type of uh, categorical uh, distribution. Um, I never want you to do a pie chart. I never want you to ever make a donut chart. <laughs> That's the answer. You should never ever in your career make, or, or hmm, I guess I could, in theory, if you force me, I could invent a case when maybe you'd want to, but virtually never do you want to use a pie chart. They're stupid, lame, horrible, and unhelpful. Why do so many people use them? Because people are stupid, lame, and unhelpful. <laughs> um, 
so the problem is, uh, you know, technically speaking, there's nothing wrong with a pie chart, right? A pie chart is, um, do I have one in here? No. So yeah, but that's not a good one. So um, so we'll we'll look at some examples in, later. But so basically, the problem is, you make a pie chart one third to one third to one third, one half to twenty five percent to twenty five percent. How that's generated is dividing up the radians, the 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 degrees that make up the circle. And so it's fine as far as, a, as it is correct in terms of how the pie chart or the donut chart, which is the same thing as a pie chart with the middle part cut out. The problem is, the problem is that's not how you, that's not how viewers perceive the data. They don't perceive the data as the outer ring of the pie chart. They perceive it as the, the amount of area within the pie chart. And that, and that, that visual perception of this display is all the time people over, uh, incorrectly estimate how big the pie chart is. If it's one fourth or one third, that's easy. Most of the time it's not. It's 78% to 12% to 11% and those, it becomes very hard for people to compare. It, just like that three, we talked about outside the 3D plot, don't ever do a 3D plot. Why? Because a person staring at your data, inspecting your data, he or she can't easily extrapolate. What, what does this mean? You get what I'm saying? They can't extrapolate the value. That's why these circular types of displays are problematic. So just don't do them. Everywhere you could do a pie chart, it would be better to do a bar chart. Every time. But business people that don't know crap Business people tend to be very poor uh, communicators oftentimes when it comes to a lot of these quantity things to wider audiences. They might be able to explain it to themselves, but they are much more like the folks next door, right? They're not used, to, they're, they're not, historically they've not been good at communicating to the public. They like pie charts. Problem, okay, uh, so stacked bar graph. Uh, uh, that would be an example on the right. Um, this is good if we want to show, you know, for example here that, oh, I lost my, I don't have a, my pointer. But so, um, so we could look at, for example, on the right hand one, if maybe this would sum to 100% or something like that, say we could say, hey, uh, how do these four different grasslands compare in terms of their insects or in terms of the birds or something of that nature, right? So one we can use that way, but they're also particularly helpful when we have the total number of birds, for example, the one on the left, in the area, which would be the, maybe the, 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 the totality of the, of the column. But then, hey, so what's the distribution of crows in there? What's the distribution of seagulls in there? What's the, right, so we, get, we can vary data dense mm -hmm. that we, if we wanted to communicate that, the composition of the community in addition to just the total number of individuals. Um, now there's, again, there's all kinds of, of potential presentation and potential formatting issues um, that you guys can choose. So I'm not trying to say you should choose just one of these starter few graphs, but it's just, you know, to start getting your feet wet if you haven't made figures very much, let's start with these simpler ones. And then once we've made a draft of that, if you're like, hey, it'd be really cool if I could do boop, 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 then you can start to get more exotic the next step. Cool? Um, so what should I have? Obviously you want your data in there. One of the first questions is going to be, am I going to have all of my data in there? For example, something like a scatter plot, or am I going to have mean values or, or summary statistics? What, what am I going to graph? And again, there's arguments for both. It's going to depend on your data, but you want to think about that before you start graphing it. What am I going to show here? Everything or, or, uh, adjusted information. Again, we talked about labels. So what is this value? What is this quantity? And what is the variable that we're measuring? And then ideally, we want to be able to pull out second order um, observations. 
So not just the data, but what is the rate of change? How does A compare to B? Those kinds of things. And then once we've added that stuff, the next step is going to be, OK, what, what can I take away and still preserve all of, all of that uh, stuff? Um, one of the most common things that you guys will ask me over the years is this. Should I do a table or a figure? And the answer is going to be, well, it depends. So here, so this data is the same on the right and the left. And this is looking at uh, a, a particular experimental drug versus a placebo. And so here we go. So, so this is the sample size. So for example, if we look at, so we're looking at um, epigastric pain on the first line there. And we're saying, hey, so 47% or 47 times out of 56 did um, we have resolution of our pain in this, uh, with regards to this particular type of pain. And that's 83.9%. Okay, that's in parentheses. And then the placebo did 28 over 42. That translates to 66%. You know, da, 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 da. Then we have the statistical test over there. Um, same data on the, on the right. It's just we're looking at, um, uh, looking at it in a figure um, way. So I would argue that there's, bo there's both values. So the one on the right is easy to skim, so to flip through and skim and say, hey, you know, how, how's, how does one versus compare to the other? But if I, but if the value is very important, the table is helpful, right? So for example, a, a reference, if you guys were repeating somebody's study and they said, I found 38.39% of the animals were dead after the fire, you probably would want a table, right? I mean, the ultimate is to have the raw data, but assuming you don't have the data, you just have somebody's paper, you probably want the table, because that's a, 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 you can get that number no problem. The figure is you can tell the pattern, but it's harder to get the exact specific number, right? So there's times and places for both of these things. Um, tables are generally best when you want to go look up something. Um, and if, if you need to report a precise value. So if we had MS4 permit violations because of this value, a table is really helpful, right? Mm -hmm. Graphs are better to show the trends. Graphs are better when we want to compare the first to the second, the third to the fourth, that kind of stuff. Um, and then this is just um, a guide that I put together to, to figure out because you guys ask me so often about this. So, um, yeah, I'll give this to you guys. But suffice it to say, um, these are all suggestions. Uh, there's, there's, there's no hard and fast rule, but, but these, I think, will help you determine if you should do a table or a graph. Um, other things, if you do do a table, you should sort, the, you should present the data meaningfully. Maybe that's maximum or the highest value to the lowest. Maybe that's the north to the south. It should be organized. It shouldn't be just some random alphabetical throwing stuff into your table. Uh, it just depends on the study, but more times than not, things like uh, uh, relational values as opposed to the raw data oftentimes are more helpful, but, but sometimes you want to have totals in there. Um, similar, if, if you have luxury and try both ways. Generally speaking, um, if you, similar data should go downward. Visually, we, we, we like that. So, so the treatment, the, we're just seeing the, the effect of the resolution of the pain, that, that data should go down in columns. Uh, you want to highlight the important comparisons. Remember, I showed you that Google thing and I, I changed the font. Mm -hmm. You can, of course, highlight a band or, or color or, or, or partially color, partially fill one of the rows or columns, let's say. And then uh, show the source of the data. In most cases, it's your study, so you don't, that's pretty obvious. OK, how about this? Has anybody seen this figure before? Yes. Where do you see it? I can't remember. What class was that? I've seen this. OK, so somebody tell me what's going on here. Stare at, the, stare at this for a second. 
Oh wait, did I give you the original? Oh, never mind. I gave it to you in French. Okay, so this, so this is the original. Okay, so um, so I'll just explain this then for you really quickly. Okay, so this is um, uh, a classic. This is this is the classic example of a data-rich display. So this is 1869, representing data from when Napoleon tried to kick the Russians' butts and got his butt kicked. Okay, so again, this is not using any PowerPoint. This is not using anything other than your brain, which is why your first graphs you need to make on pen and paper without anything else, right? So that's all these guys had. That's all Menard had. And this was awesome. So this is in my office at home because I'm a geek and I'm a nerd. <laughs> okay, let's start with the beige colored representation. Does anybody, anybody remember what this is? Is anybody in another class you might want to start on it for us, try for us? No. Nobody remembers, okay. So this is both a map and a and a historio historiography, right? This is a bunch of stuff in here. So map-wise, the, the spatial layout here goes from France to Russia. Mm -hmm. So we're starting in the west, and we are moving to the right. What are we moving? We're moving people, we're moving armies. So the width of this uh, beige bar is, represents in a consistent proportionality, so a consistent ratio, represents how many men in the army Napoleon started with at the beginning of the campaign. Mm -hmm. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. And then, this is how they marched. Okay, so this, so this, this up, down, doo -doo -doo -doo, this is the direction these folks were moving in, a, in, in organized columns. So check it out. We start out, and we go for a while, and all of a sudden, boop, the first shoot jumps off to the north, so a, a, a branch takes off, yeah? So now, look, now the width is smaller. Now we start going farther. Then we hit this, um, an another group breaks off, and they go off. And then we keep marching, but look what happens now. It's a certain width, and then all of a sudden, it sawtooths, it gets smaller, and then it gets, smaller and then it gets smaller these are not battles these are not people shooting at each other necessarily they never made it. what's going on here is the winter yeah. these people are, are starving to death or dying of exposure so then on the um, uh, bottom here right so here these guys are going and we're talking about the temperature Right, so this is, this is environmental conditions on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So these guys are marching, marching, marching. They're going up, they're going up, they're going up. Uh, and I should say the beige is the, going, is the advancing part of the story. The black is the retreat when, the, when they, they turn around and head back. Mm -hmm. So they go all the way to Moscow and look at it. There hasn't really been any significant battles, but look, look how wide it is up at Moscow compared to the width that we started, we started the campaign at. They freeze, they can't break, so then they turn around and they start coming back. They go to the south to try to get warmer, and they start going, <coughs> excuse me, they start going back um, westward. And they're dying, 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 dying. They're, they're reinforced by this little uh, break-off unit that came back and joined them, so they get they get a little bit uh, thicker here, and then they did it. And look at how many look at the proportion of folks that survived this encounter. So here we have map, we have geospatial stuff, we have where they are in the landscape, we have how many people, we have environmental conditions, um, we have the time involved there too. That's crazy. There's six. Six different variables in this figure, generated hundreds of years ago. Now, it might be in French, it might be, you might not read the language, but I would argue this is very elegant. This is a huge amount of data condensed into a very readable format. 
what would be the what would be the other thing here? What would be the the, the contrasting way to be presented? Tables and tables and tables. Way harder to read. Way harder to take away the conclusions. Way harder to interpret. Also, way harder to do that that second order interpretation. Well, hey, I wonder when they are at town X, how do they compare going versus coming, right? Much easier in this well-designed, elegant uh, format. Agreed? Okay, so that's Charles Menard's uh, map of the Napoleon's attack. How about this one? Here's a more modern ver Here's a more modern graph. This is from a recent newspaper article. So stare at this for a second. Tell me if you can figure out what's going on here. So if you guys are in the back, you might not be able to quite read that these, that my cursor's still gone, that near each of these dots is a date. And so the first one on the um, uh, lower, uh, uh, the, the first one here, by it says annual average, it starts 1956. And then if we follow that line all the way up, down, right, left, brrr, this last one where it, the line is dotted, it says February 2010, which is when this article was, or soon after, soon before this article was written. <laughs> right. So this, so this is kind of, so check this out. So this is, this is time. This is distance driven. This is price per gallon. Right. That's a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. There's no crazy three dimensional bars that you can't read that, you know, this is a well thought out figure. Now, would this have worked if the, if the, um, the way the data played out that, you know, some of these dots had crossed over and it made zigzags and X's and so, probably not. But for the way this particular data played out, these guys tried this out and said, ooh, hey, maybe this is a useful way to show multi dimensions of data, multi variables in one two dimensional plot. So maybe you guys, maybe, that, maybe that's useful to you, maybe it's not. Again, it's a line chart. So we know that if we follow the dots, we're going in order. In this case, it's time order. So we're going from year one to year two, to year three, to year four, to year five, to year six. Cool? How about this? Good, bad, what do you think about this? Good, why? At least you say good? Who said good? Yeah, you can understand that they say the fluctuations of the yellow perch and how it died off in 93 compared to the rainbow smelt. And like right, so it looks like something happened and the red dudes went away and the blue dudes came, came up. <laughs> now, just looking at the graph, we don't know did, did the blue dudes eat the red or what's going on, but we, but we do know that as one went away, another one uh, came in, right? Mm -hmm. And so we don't know the, what we're talking about here, a lake, uh, uh, a series of lakes, whatever, but we know that this is how many fish we caught per day. Now here's an example, somebody's asked about this. Uh, we could leave off year, I would argue. Leave off the, the Y-E-A-R part. Mm -hmm. I think we could probably figure out what was going on here, that this was time. Mm -hmm. But here we go, so here we have, not only that, but look, at maybe, Maybe people aren't familiar with the fish, or maybe they are a little bit familiar. So now we have the shape of them built into that, right? Boom. That might be helpful for people that might know, oh, this is a long cigar-shaped fish. This is more of a, of a uh, uh, oval-shaped fish. I'd say this is much better than a little red line that says yellow perch, and a little blue line that says rainbow smelt, right? So it's accomplishing the same thing. We can tell that blue is rainbow smelt. We can tell that red is yellow perch. But again, it's adding more depth. It's adding more complexity. It's adding more information conveyed. So hey, that's pretty cool. How about this one? Definitely data dense. Somebody help me. <laughs> Allie, what are we looking at here? Or Natalie, that's good, that's oh, good. Sorry. That's good, that's good, that's good, it's, good. it's fine, it's good. Go, 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 go. I was like, man, did I just have a seizure or something? I thought I said, 
<laughs> right. Okay. So yeah. No. 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 Tell me. Okay. What do you think? Well, so what's going? How about so? So so. What are you going to look at? How about this? What are we going to look at to figure out what's going on? No, Natalie, go. Tell me. So, so, so what's going on here, or how about what are we first going to look at to maybe figure out what's going on here? Oh, now Alex. So now I'm getting, I'm totally having some kind of seizure thing. It's very clear. Um, go. Okay, good. So the text, okay, good, the text. But here they're trying to help you. Here's step one. There's step two. There's step three. Maybe that's helpful, maybe that's not. But it's a technique you could try. If you had something that was really first this, and then that, and then this, you could try leading people through. You could try arrows. Look at this figure, and then this, and then that maybe. But these guys are saying, hey, first look at this. <coughs> Between 97 and 2007, we had a huge growth in the number of people uh, incarcerated in the country of Brazil, right? Only four other countries in the world at that time had a higher proportional growth. So that's what they're showing. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. And then, oh my god, it's the most in the, U in the Americas, in the New World. Okay, then, bang, then you jump to the second column. And then, bang, you jump to the third. Right? And so the red in, in this next figure, the red is showing uh, increase, in this case of our incarceration. The black is showing instances of, of decreasing, and on and on and on. So, okay, that one might be hard to see in the back of the room, but, but I would argue it's at least data dense. Maybe you think it's too dense, but this is, there's a ton of data in here where the authors want you to take some conclusion, but there's enough in there when you, where you can start to explore it and ask your own questions. How about this one? Mm-hmm. So we're looking at how, how common roads are. Mm -hmm. So on the x-axis, distance from the nearest road in, what is it, in meters. On the y-axis, it's the proportion of the lower 48 states that's within that distance. So if I look over here at, this, at the second pink dot, that's by the 20, you guys with me? Mm -hmm. So that's saying 20% of the land of the lower 48 states is, and I drop down here, boom. 20% of the land is within, I don't know, this is 1,000, this is 500, this is 250. So it looks like maybe on the order of 100, 150 meters. 20%, one fifth of the land is within a, a, a 100 meters or 200 meters of, of a road. Yeah? How about this? 80%, let's drop down, 80% of the land is within a kilometer or so of a road. Okay, you guys, you guys don't like that? Okay, fine, I see what's going on. How about this one? How about this one? Tell me what's going on with this figure. What are we looking at? Yep, yep, taxable income. And how much it's grown. So how much it grew from back in the day to 1990, and 19, or well, what it was in 1990, and then what it became uh, when they generated this graph, which is in 2007. You guys with me? And so this is, this is ordered by the value. Is this ordered by the value in 1990 or, valued, or, or ranked by the value in 2007? 2007, 2007 right? So it's, it's the two bars combined. It's the farthest to the right. Mm -hmm. So this is ranked highest to lowest. So we've, we have been getting more richer. At least the richest folks have been getting richer here. How about this? There's a figure from one of your previous students. Uh, this, is, this stands for Santa Rosa Island Fish Abundance, uh, and, and it says being independent of the marine protected area. Marine protected, 
From the edge, yeah, distance from the edge into it. So in other words, the distance into or the distance out of the, mm. the marine protected area. And so this is saying that, so this first bar is when we go 20 meters in from the edge, either 20 meters in or 20 meters out, <coughs> there's no statistically significantly different amount of fish. Mm. Right? There's a little bit, there's a hint for a little more orange, but they're not, with the error bars, they're not statistically significantly different. So, so the amount of fish that are 20 meters in versus 40 versus 60 versus 100, maybe 100, but, but overall, there's no difference in, if anything, there's more fish outside yeah. as opposed to inside. Okay? 